Welcome to the eighth episode of the sixth season of the Ubuntu podcast. In this episode, we're going to talk to Michael Hall about core apps for Ubuntu phone, and we'll have some gooey love. Finally, no, not even finally, plus we'll go over our feedback. (laughs) So much. (laughs) Sorry, I jumped to the end there. Um, If you're listening live, you can send us messages using the chat facility on the website and in the IRC channel. I'm Laura, and joining me are Mark. Hello. Hello. Alan. Greetings. (laughs) <laughs> and Tony. Good evening. So what have we been doing lately? Ooh, I don't know. What have you been doing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll see how you did that. Yeah, well done. <laughs> I've on. been moonlighting on the Doctor Who podcast. What? Oh. <sighs> Is that you were there for, for... That's why you weren't here the last for a month. two weeks. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> they have very long recording sessions. Yeah. It's yeah. take them that long to edit it. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> So how was how was the experience of being on another show? It was fun and it it was very different because it was all by Skype. Ooh. So I sat oh. on my own in a room with a Skype setup, which oh. kindly provided by producer of the Ubuntu UK podcast. <laughs> yes, hello. That's you. you. <laughs> <laughs> the technical producer. Uh, okay. Wow. They get titles, Mark. We don't. <laughs> We're just the talent. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yeah. so you can find it at the Doctor Who Podcast dot com. Cool, cool. Mm. What about you, Alan? I uh, I have been playing with uh, core apps, right? Uh, with apps mm. that are possibly uh, appropriate for going on Ubuntu phones and tablets. Ooh. And uh, uh, I've been working with Michael Hall on that, and we'll talk more about that in uh, an interview we've got coming up. Yes, so we'll right, talk to yeah. Michael uh, in a second, don't we? Yeah. So Ooh. what's your involvement with, with the uh, core apps? So I'm helping the uh, developers get what they need from us at Canonical. So, uh, for example, if they need information about APIs or they want to let us know about which features are missing from the SDK, we can communicate that back to the developers. We're kind of a barrier between... The, <laughs> the unwashed the, the <laughs> developers the words are developers and the canonical stuff because the canonical guys are uh, working absolutely mad to get all this stuff done and so we're trying to buffer that and make sure we get all the documentation put publicly so that you know we're not badgering the canonical guys with the same questions over and over again and making ppas with all the packages in and all that kind of good stuff cool is Brilliant. this is this you as canonical or in com- me as canonical com- yeah okay. you as canonical <laughs> the, embo- <laughs> the embodiment of canonical well why don't we why don't we hear from michael about what he's been up to yes let's do that On the line from the Sunshine State, we have Michael Hall from the Canonical Community Team. Hello, Mike. How are you? Hello. I'm good. Excellent. So I wanted to get you on the phone because you've been uh, blogging furiously over the last uh, week or so uh, about core apps. And I wanted to get uh, some more detail about what core apps is and what it relates to. So give me the 30-second elevator pitch of what is core apps. So core apps are what we identified as things that we really need to have as part of a complete phone offering when we go to uh, an OEM or a carrier. Um, And what we've been referring to as the core apps are the ones that are being done outside of Canonical. So when we started this project, we knew that we wanted community involvement in really the foundational aspects of the phone. And so we opened up... uh, most of these apps to community development from the start, and they've been community-led ever since. So um, these are the, if, when you can eventually buy an Ubuntu phone from a shop, these are going to be the apps which come on the phone by default? And is There's that be- no guarantee that they will. Right, okay. I mean, it's ultimately going to be up to the hardware manufacturer and the network operator what's on there. Mm -hmm. Um, These are the kinds of apps that we know people are going to want. And there's a very very good chance that some or most of these will end up as the default apps for the phone. But again, there's no guarantee what's going to happen in the future. What sorts of apps are they? Uh, The primary ones are the calculator, the clock, the calendar, weather email client, document viewer, RSS reader. Uh, I'm trying to remember what else. Oh, YouTube, YouTube. and um, Facebook are the community-led ones. 
And so, then inside of Canonical, uh, they had already started developing the camera, the dialer, the gallery, and the notes app. And the web browser. And the web browser, yeah. <laughs> so how did you decide which one of those which of those apps were going to be community-led and which ones were going to be Canonical internal? Uh, it was mostly a matter of whichever ones we weren't already doing internally at Canonical prior to the announcements anything that wasn't already started was opened up to community involvement. So basically when the phone was demoed at, at um, CES and MWC, there was a set of apps already on there and everything after that is community maintained basically. Right. And I should be clear, the, the ones that Canonical was already working on are still open for community contribution. Mm-hmm. They're just being led by teams in Canonical. There are people in Canonical where their day job is to work on these apps. Whereas for what we're calling core apps, they're being led by the community and their community is the primary developers of it. So in terms of designing the apps, um, is is there somebody in Canonical leading the design from the design team or is it there a style guide that the community then follows? So we do have a design team that's been working with these apps, and they chose four of them to start with. That is the clock, the calendar, the calculator, and weather. And they have produced detailed uh, user interface guides for those, and they're working on detailed visual and style guides for them now also. Um, We also opened up the design process to the community and got quite a bit of uh, mock-ups provided for both those four apps and all of the other apps that we're doing. How do you guarantee that you don't end up with a hundred different calculators? Uh, We don't. And probably if you go look at the uh, Android market or the iPhone store, you'll find a whole bunch of different calculators. In fact, Uh, the, 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 the design for the one that, uh, that the calculator core app guys are working on is fairly, restrictive it's a very limited set of functionality isn't it so you know anyone could create one that's you know much more complicated and more featureful than the one that's been designed couldn't they oh absolutely and i expect that somebody eventually will uh i know we already have uh an alternative weather app that's being worked on outside of the uh design and the core apps team that's working on the one that we're uh we're driving you made a comparison with the Android Play Store and the iPhone iTunes App Store. Is that entirely fair? Is it a, a, an equivalent? It is a target. Uh, that's okay. you know that that's what we're driving towards. It's so, obviously not there yet, and I can't really give you any time frame on when I think it will be. But so, uh, obviously, that's the the kind of ecosystem that we want to build around Ubuntu, also. So it won't just be useful utilities. There's a scope for there to be games and stupid things that don't really do anything for people, but are fun. Soundboards of John O'Bacon's head. Yeah, yeah, things yes. involving <laughs> John O saying the same thing over and over again. Um, and you know, very niche utilities that somebody maybe has come up with that maybe only appeal to a handful of people. Exactly. So um, one of the apps that I've seen being written is a um, a transistor calculator of some sort that really would seem only useful to a subset of electrical engineers but you know the fact that it's being made shows that there is definitely people right. willing to do stuff for niche markets do you think that um the the sort of where where the current people working on these apps are coming from is people who have been working on other mobile platforms or is it people who have been doing sort of desktop ubuntu or web development before It seems to be a mix of both. We've had a lot of people with prior Qt experience Mm -hmm. on other uh, Qt-based mobile devices. Oh, right, yeah. Um, We've had a few people who have done iPhone or Android development a little bit, and then we've had quite a few where this is their first mobile app. Mm -hmm. So where did did those um, people come from? Are they people from the existing Ubuntu community? Are they they just, you know, random people? How how did we gather those people together to work on these apps? When we announced the phone initially back in, was it January? Mm -hmm. Um, We had a form on the website for people to sign up if they were interested in doing development on that platform. And when we went to... uh, recruit people to work on these core apps we went through the the submissions on that form found people who had already 
prior knowledge of uh, Qt or QML or JavaScript so that they wouldn't have to learn a whole new platform to get started. But then outside of the core apps, we're seeing a lot of development from people who have been in the community for a while or even people who are new to the community and just got interested in the platform when they heard the announcements. How much um, guidance is there or checking of the the, the development, how, how the things are developed and architected and designed from a coding point of view? So recently we've had some canonical engineers looking over the code that's being written for the core apps. There wasn't a lot that was given ahead of time in terms of architecture or code layout and design. Uh, it really was community-led. We got the teams together. We said, okay, these are the features that we want them to have. Uh, the design team gave uh, workflows for how the user should interact with the app. Mm -hmm. And then it was really left up to the community people to actually put the code together and how to structure it. Will there be a formal review process for new apps? For example, one of the big differences between the iTunes and Android stores is that anybody can put anything in Android, whereas iTunes, there's Apple doing some sort of quality control. Um, I don't know too much on that um, as far as the actual business process would be. I do know that one of the goals by 14.04 for Ubuntu as a platform is to be able to isolate apps so that they can't access resources that the user hasn't given them permission to access. They can't stomp all over other apps or the rest of your system. So right now, to get into the Ubuntu Software Center, apps have to go through a review process where somebody actually looks through their code, um, if it's an open source app, or gets some guarantee from the developer if it's a closed source, that the app's not going to do anything bad or harmful the user system but that doesn't scale very well if you've got one person per app doing these reviews have you had so, any um any any interest from individuals or companies who actually want to write closed source apps for the uh, ubuntu phone platform uh i haven't heard any about the phone platform the commercial app developer engagement is handled ah, by the right. uh, consumer apps team thing. inside of canonical okay so i don't hear about what's going on on that i I have heard that one of the game engines, mm -hmm. I think, will run on the Ubuntu Touch platform. And I know there's interest in getting like a lot of the HTML5 games and stuff running on it. So I'm sure there will be commercial interest in this. You mentioned um, gaming engines and uh, and toolkits and uh, and things. The, the SDK that we've put out, um, is based around Qt Creator. Are, are the developers using that? Are they getting on well with that? Are they finding it meets the requirements they need for the apps they're developing? For the apps that are currently being written, yes, they seem to. Uh, obviously, the SDK is still in a very early state, and we're getting improvements to it uh, relatively uh, frequently. So we're getting feedback from developers on what's missing, and we're building that into it. Mm-hmm. Um, right now, the primary focus has been on Qt Creator and QML as the uh, development platform. Mm -hmm. But uh, we also plan on supporting uh, a rich HTML5 environment and also giving direct access to uh, OpenGL ES. So if you're going to do a 3D game or something and you need to access the OpenGL directly, you would be able to do that also. What um, do the current APIs provide in terms of um, access to hardware features? So, for instance, on my Nexus 4, I've got a camera, I've got um, near-field communication, I've got Bluetooth, I've got sound, all, all that sort of, you know, the stuff you expect to have on a mobile device. How well is that supported in the app APIs at the moment? Uh, in theory, very well, because uh, there's been a lot of work from Nokia and mm -hmm. now Digia to uh, support that in Qt itself. Right. Um, as far as what's working right now on Ubuntu Touch, that I'm not sure about. That's more uh, a question of hardware enablement mm -hmm. on the platform and not in, in the SDK. Right. So there's there's you can write apps which should be able to do it, but it's um, it might be a case of it's not going to work on every device yet. Right. Right. Okay. So beyond the the core apps. Um, 
I noticed you've been blogging furiously about uh, other apps. Um, can you talk more about how, how some of those uh, app developers might be able to get their apps on devices and how, how they can um, get their, their apps seen by more people, perhaps? So that, that's a question that we're trying to come up with a good solution to right now. Um, part of our plans for 1404 is to provide enough app isolation, like I was mentioning earlier, mm -hmm. that we can automate a lot of the submission process and they don't have to go through manual reviews. Um, we're also looking at easier ways to package and distribute apps uh, that may be different from what we're currently using on the desktop. Um, as far as the developer preview images go, we're more open to just including stuff on those images to try them out and get them tested and get feedback on them, uh, even if they're not apps that we would want to ship by default or even apps that may necessarily make it into whatever online store we end up providing. So if, if somebody's currently writing an app that they think might have widespread use or interest and they want to uh, try it on the developer preview images that we're offering for the Nexus devices, um, they can contact uh, me or you, Alan, in uh, <laughs> oh, yes. the Hash Bunch You Touch <laughs> channel on IRC um, and talk to us about it and we'll work on getting those in. Um, we have recently opened up a new PPA where we're going to start uh, including as many apps as we can find and get packaged to make them easy to install on the uh, devices to test out. And the the teams that are working on the core apps, how, how many people are typically in each team? And are there, are there any gaps? Are there any places where, you know, you think there could be more people getting involved? Are there any, um, is there a requirement for more people? There is definitely a requirement for more people. Uh, we've got four or five people, I think, per team but the number of those that are active varies. Uh, some teams are full of active contributors and are making a lot of progress. Uh, some other teams don't have active contributors and haven't shown any progress. So we definitely have room for people who want to get involved and plenty of stuff for them to do. And if anybody's interested in doing that, then uh, they should ping me on IRC. I'm mhall119. Or email me, mhall119 at ubuntu.com. And what sort of skills um, should those people have? Uh, at least some knowledge of QML. Right. Uh, some knowledge of Qt would be helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some apps that are writing their own QML plugins to provide functionality that they could only get from Qt and C++. Mm -hmm. But QML is pretty easy. Yeah, and there's some good tutorials out. as well on the um, the the like resources for the SDK have some good um, good links to tutorials that I've uh, right. I've played with. And of course, you don't have to be a member of these development teams to submit code to it either. Mm -hmm. Anybody can uh, you know grab the branch, make their changes, and submit them back as a merge proposal in the launch pad. Cool. So Ubuntu, hash Ubuntu dash touch is the RC channel where people can get in touch with you. Yes. And we've got everybody from platform engineers to designers to app developers in there. Excellent. Well, I think we all look forward to seeing some funky, wonderful apps coming out uh, as a result of this effort and uh, look forward to playing with them on a phone when I get sent one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good luck with that yeah. um, well, and thank you very much indeed for spending just a few minutes talking to us this evening Michael thank you right, cheers, cheers. cheers. Bye. Bye. bye bye And now it's time for some gooey love. Yay! Oh, yeah. And this week's gooey love is Gnome Do, as suggested by Dave Hills. And he emailed in and said, Hi, podcasters. My gooey love is for Gnome Do. It nicely complements the Unity HUD search in that it can search my Chromium bookmarks. It has loads of plugins, and I've been using it since 1004, 
as I learned that hardcore geeks don't have time to lift their fingers from the keyboard to use a mouse, mouse pad, or nipple to click on shortcut icons. I nearly made it through that. I do actually find it quite efficient. The only downer is being 50 plus. I have trouble remembering names of apps or bookmarks I'm trying to search for. Ah, okay. So Gnome Do is a bit like the HUD search. No, well, it complements the HUD. So Gnome Do is a thing that you press a certain combination of keys. It's like um, if you've ever used a Mac, it's yes. like Spotlight on the Mac. So you press a certain combination oh, okay. of keys and a thing pops up in the middle of the screen. You can use it to launch apps, a bit like the Dash. Ooh. Yeah. But um, it also has lots of plugins so that it can do other things with what you type in. Like, like look, can, up, look up words in a dictionary yeah, and stuff. Calculator, yeah. that sort of thing. It's been around a while, hasn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah it's, it's been quite a long lot. time. Yeah. Mm. And it's written with mono. Oh, ah, right. But it doesn't clash with Unity. It's still, even though it's as long been as you have it on a different key combination. Mm. Right, can you configure those? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Well, you can configure the Gnome Do one. <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't know if you can configure the Unity one. No. That's another thing Alan doesn't know. That's, yeah, that's what I love about open source. Choice. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about choice. You apparently. could recompile uh, Unity. Yeah, and then it's it open source. Can, yeah, then it can have whatever key combination you want. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dave. For, yes, uh, thank, thank you very much. Yeah. Our mailbags have been bulging, so it's time for us to review some of your feedback. And first up, Johan in Sweden emailed us asking for some advice. I'm returning to Linux after several years on the dark side, Windows. I have installed Ubuntu 1210 on one of my older laptops, and it turns out that it doesn't work very well with Unity, so I'm considering Ubuntu after listening to your second episode this season. I've also read good things about Linux Mint, Linux Mint, and they also provide an XFCE version, which is also based on Ubuntu 12.10. So my question to you, why should I consider one of these alternatives before another? And are there any other considerations except that Ubuntu is a recognised flavour of Ubuntu? All right, I'll give you two. Uh, I'll give you one alternative and two good reasons to use Ubuntu rather than Linux Mint. <laughs> a good, a good alternative is Lubuntu. Um, in fact, I'll give you two of uh, two alternatives. So Zubuntu is great, Lubuntu is great, and Crunchbang is also awesome. Ah, uh, yes. The ever awesome Phil Newber. Yes. They also all three of those are pretty good on low end machines that maybe don't have three D acceleration or a low on memory or don't have a super fast CPU. As a reason for not using Linux Mint, Linux Mint. I'll give you two reasons. One, uh, <laughs> two <laughs> for the price of one. <clears throat> it's like the Romans. <laughs> roll up, roll up. Uh, Linux Mint, as I understand it, their update manager uh, prevents certain updates by default being installed, and those can be including security updates, and I don't think that is a very sensible idea. Uh, they, they, by default, block uh, security updates that we do in Ubuntu uh, from installing until they've tested them. So even though we've tested them, they have to test them on Mint before you get them, and I don't think that's a wise idea. And the second reason is Mint, in the past has been even worse than Ubuntu at doing upgrades. Yeah. So you have to reinstall oh, rather than upgrade. Bad. Yeah. <laughs> Those are lots of reasons. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, hopefully some useful advice for Johan there. Gareth Whitty left a comment on our website also asking for advice. What photo tools in Ubuntu do you use or could you recommend? I have GIMP and Shotwell, but what other little gems do you know of? Do we know anyone who's I, a photographer? <laughs> I don't know. It would be really handy if one of our presenters did a lot of photography work. Tony, do you know anyone who... Uh, I, I have been known to <laughs> Doing take commercial photography, no less. Indeed. Um, so I use the GIMP if I need to do uh, detailed image work and retouching and stuff. It is the kind of Photoshop equivalent on uh, Ubuntu. There are some other graphics packages. I think there's a KDE... Uh, sort of equivalent. Um, Come on, the... Mark. <laughs> Criter? Critter? Yes. I've never been sure how to pronounce it. Yeah, I think yeah. that rings a bell. It, yeah, part of the K Office suite. Mm. It's quite, it got, got quite a nice interface. But Shotwell is the kind of photo managing application, mm -hmm. and it's the default one available in Ubuntu. Um, there are others. F Spot does it. Mm -hmm. um, I use one that's closed source, proprietary, called... Because <gasps> you hate freedom. Because I hate freedom, called Aftershot Pro. Is that the one you use for processing raw images? That's yes. the one that used to be called Bibble. It is mm. indeed. Yes. It's excellent. And there's also the KDE one called mm. Digicam. Digicam, yes. Ah, yes. Which, which I good. used to use, and that yeah. was really good. Yeah, yeah. it was good. 
Um, and I think there's there's G Thumb as well, which you can yeah. sort of use as a bit of a photo. Oh, that's quite basic, well. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's very basic. I use and shot image magic, there. of course. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> if you like doing your photo editing from the from command, command line. line. Yeah, and if you want to move your photos around, maybe use bash and the move command. <laughs> Laura, what are you saying about Shotwell? I was just saying I used Shotwell again for the first time in a while the other day and it imported a lot of photos pretty well. Mm. And um, it now supports reading the tags from the metadata, um, from the EXIF data, which I had been adding on in the app on my tablet. And it put, pulled them out as ah, tags, cool. which apparently is new in Shotwell. I think. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I've not seen that before. Just to finish that thought off, there are a couple of uh, other applications useful for processing raw photos. Um, Dark Table is one that gets a lot of recommendations and seems to be developed reasonably quickly. Raw Studio and UF Raw are the uh, other two that people talk about a lot. Cool. Loads of tips there. Mm, indeed. Dave Jeffrey left a comment on our website. I think you're perhaps a tad hard on Linux video editors here. KDN Live is really rather good video editor. I can do everything on it I used to do in Premiere Elements and more. AVI Demux is also very, very handy. There are still a few conspicuous feature gaps, things like recording commentary whilst watching a video, but these are being worked on and I find it surprisingly stable. Other than that, it's another fantastic episode. You always find stuff that's interesting that I've missed, and I thought Alan's testing of Launchpad to prove the Fedora problem could happen to anyone was a really generous gesture. That was a bit of a laugh, really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dave Jeffrey has uh, an excellent YouTube channel. Um, cool. Uh, I think it's called Stupid Rubbish. <laughs> That's not my Sell opinion. It, Dave. It's, uh, but he, he makes uh, remakes of old station idents and stuff from like the old days of BBC and like Channel the spinning Sport. globes, the spinning globes, and the thing in between a schools program and oh, yes. uh, you know the the clock and all kinds of stuff. But he remakes them with. Um, like sometimes he'll add a bit of fuzz or a grainy effect to make it look old, uh -huh. and it, it looks really genuine. Like it was like taken off an old, old VHS, VHS tape, yeah, exactly. But he uses Caden Live to do it. Uh, yeah. He uses open oh, source wow. and Inkscape and and uh, yeah, loads of well, open the source stuff. I must admit, the last time I used KDN Live was a good few years ago, and it was very crashy at the time. I, well, I suppose you have to go back and reevaluate them every so often, but yeah. I, I haven't really had cause to do so. And I, and I think, uh, yeah, uh, I accept uh, <laughs> the criticism there from Dave because Dave uses a video editor uh, mu much more than I do, so yeah. you know, he knows about it. Absolutely. Well done, Dave. Uh, Gord Campbell from Toronto, Canada has commented on video editors on Ubuntu. One, if you begin with Sinalera for Grandma, link in the show notes, you'll probably find that Sinalera is a fine video editor. Sorry, that's a bit of a mouthful. In particular, it's simple to trim videos, do the tail first, and do titles. Lots of tutorials on YouTube too. Two, there are lots of people in the Western world interested in QQ, the Chinese video conferencing software. It's the main reason I can't begin to contemplate getting my wife off Windows. She video conferences with her grandson 12,000 kilometres away almost every day. Between the Toronto and Vancouver metropolitan areas, there are about one million Chinese people, and most of them have relatives in China. That's a very good point, because we're talking about Kylin, the uh, um, Ubuntu uh, derivative that uh, is based, is, is being promoted and localised for China. Yeah, very yes. good point. Yeah. Sinalera is a, or was, again, the last time I looked at it, it was a monolithic download that bundles sorts of clashing libraries and things in with it maybe things have changed someone once told me uh Sinalera is the emacs of video editors yeah that's which right. sounds about right i like the fact you have to do the editing at the end first take the tail off first <laughs> mike crow emailed to suggest we avoid the threat of more quizzes by interviewing someone from debian what with the current Debian project leader election and the imminent release of Wheezy, there should be plenty to talk about. Perhaps the new DPL, the outgoing DPL, or a prominent UK Debian type like Steve McIntyre or Phil Hans again. Also, despite not being keen on the new format when it was first proposed, I think it does work well. So keep it up. Hey. Okay. Sounds like a good idea. Yep. Yep. Good idea. And Dave Hill, 650 on Twitter, said, Loving... The oh, you read that bit out, Alan. Yeah, I will. Well, you? It's got my name on it. <laughs> <laughs> loving the podcast. Thanks for providing me with something nice to listen to on my commute home. Oh, thank you for the lovely tweet, Dave. Cool. Well, if you've got ideas for who you'd like us to interview on the show, get in touch in one of the many ways that are listed on our website and let us know. We can't promise it, but we can at least reach out to the person concerned and try. Um, Phelan Whiteley, who's listening live in the IRC channel, would like to say that Gwenview is a really good photo editor, photo manager. Yeah. Um, so, you know, he's going to kill us if we don't mention that. So we just did. Crikey. And that's the end of your feedback. <laughs> 
the Ubuntu podcast needs you. Yes, you. If there's something you think we should talk about or someone we should talk to, tweet at UUPC or email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can also talk to us on the telephone, Skype, Facebook and Google+. Find links to all these places on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. And remember, if we don't hear from you, we might not have enough content. And that can only mean one thing, more quizzes. And that's it for this episode. Join us on Wednesday the 24th of April at 7.30 UT- no, 19.30 UTC for our next live episode. That's 20.30 BST for those in the UK. Basically mm. half eight if you're in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see you at half eight. All yeah. Right. And well done for everybody who managed to make this live episode and the previous live episode um, by remembering the clocks had changed. Yes. Yes. Anyway, we'll see you next time. See you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.